Riverside family, we are so glad that you are gathered around your television, laptop, tablet, uh, cell phone, whatever device you have to worship with us live online. And uh, we want this you to participate in worship this morning. We want you to join us as we're worshiping here in our facility, streaming this out to you and your family. We want you to worship along with us, sing along with us, take notes during the message. But right now, what we want you to do is grab your phone, take out your cell phone, and go ahead and open up the messages function so that you can send a text message to us at 864-469-4084. 864-469-4084. This is our text line, and we want you to communicate with us so that you can stay connected throughout the worship service. If you have a prayer need, you can type the word prayer, and we're going to be praying over those needs as a staff and as a group to, uh, together. We want to pray for you, uh, but we'd love to hear about who's watching with you, where you're watching from. So if you just want to send us a message letting us know that you're watching uh, and the names of the people there in your family and, and how you're watch it, watching, if you have questions about the message, we're going to be monitoring the text line throughout the entire service today, and our team is here to connect with you and to pray for you and to join you as you worship with with us live inside your homes. We also want to make sure that you have an opportunity to worship through giving. We as a church are called to help take this message of hope around the globe where we share that message that only comes through Jesus, the hope that only comes through Jesus. And we've got a lot of different ways that we can do that. First of all, if you are watching and joining us because your church is not meeting today and does, doesn't have a live stream option, we want to make sure that you give. But don't give to us. Give to your church. Get out that checkbook if that's how you normally give. If your church has an online option, go ahead and give to your church now as they continue to try to make sure that they're doing and making a difference for the sake of the gospel in their community. We want you to support them. If you're a member of RBC, you can go to rbcgreer.com uh, and you can give online there. That's the easiest way for you to give from your living room at home. You can also text the word give to 864-469-4084. It'll send you back a link so that you can give via text. You can also, if you normally send in your uh, gifts via check and you do that through the offering plate on a regular basis each Sunday when you're gathered with us, you can mail those to our church address and that's on the screen for you to see right now. We've also, if you normally give by check, we've sent some communication to you this week to allow you to make that process easier for you so that you can continue to give while we're not able to meet in person. We also want to encourage you that if we were gathered together as a congregation today, we would be kicking off our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. And when whether you give online, whether you give via envelope and check and mail that in, there are all kinds of ways that you can designate a portion of your above and beyond giving to Annie Armstrong Easter offering for North American missions. We want to make sure our friends like Derek Duvall and our churches out in Salt Lake City and all other church planners all over our North America can continue to have the funding they need to take the hope of the gospel in their community. And so we want to make sure that we're still giving above and beyond to our Annie Armstrong Easter offering. Let's pray together as we prepare to continue in worship through song and as we give together in worship. Father God, we thank you for the technology that allows us to gather together in homes all over our area, worshiping you together as one church family at the same time. In our living rooms, we are not physically together, but here we are singing praises to your name, celebrating the fact that you sent your son to die for us so that we could have hope, hope in a time that we desperately need hope. And so Lord, today as we worship you together as one body in a lot of locations, Lord, we worship you through giving back just a portion of what you've blessed us with so that we can continue to get this message of hope out to people around us. Lord, together we worship you through song. We worship you through the word as we're going to be challenged later by Pastor Chris and we study your word. So Lord, today may everything that we do as a church body, both on this campus and in our living rooms, be about you and about worshiping you. And Lord, we'll give you the praise, the honor, and the glory for the way that we see lives transformed because of you. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We want you to worship with us. We want you to worship with us in your living rooms. We want you to worship with us wherever you're sitting today, wherever you're gathering to watch today. At the end of the day, our worship comes from our heart. And I pray that this morning, that you, wherever you may be, 
We'll take just a moment. You'll put everything to the side, no distractions, and you will worship. May your neighbors hear your worship coming from your home. May you raise the roof and praise to Jesus, our holy and most wonderful King. So as we take this through this time today, I want to challenge you. Put all the distractions that could take you away from worshiping the God most high. In the darkness we are waiting without hope, without light. Till the heaven you came running, there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill.
I just want to pray this morning for our world. And Father, I just want to pray, dear God, that your anointing and your presence would be felt all around the world today. And Father, we know that there is only one hope, only one hope, whether it's for cancer, whether it's for coronavirus whether it's for eternity 
regardless of where somebody is looking for hope, the only place hope is found is in you, Jesus Christ. So today, I pray as we continue to worship, as Pastor Chris brings your word, I pray, dear Jesus, that many thousands would find hope today the only place they can find it, and that is in you. We love you, Jesus, and we thank you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Well, thank you so much for watching at home. Uh, We understand that this is a little bit uncomfortable for all of us. We would rather be gathering together. That's what the Bible prescribes. That's what we would rather be doing. But we are falling under the authority that we have found uh, that God has placed over us. And so we're trying to limit the gatherings. So thank you for worshiping at home. I also want to take a moment and just say thank you to our media team. These guys go undetected, unnoticed every single week. And yet they have worked tirelessly this week to make sure that we are able to do this. And I know we had some issues. That was not our fault. That was something that happened external of us, but we were able to get back up as quickly as possible. And so I'm thankful for these guys and the efforts that they give. You know, as I was thinking about today and thinking about being online, to be honest, I got a little concerned because I read somewhere or I heard sometime that the camera adds 10 pounds And immediately I thought to myself, I really hope that our entire congregation has widescreen TVs because that's going to be the best opportunity for them to follow along with us today. If you have your Bible and you want to join us today, we're going to be in Matthew chapter 21. You can turn, tap, swipe, flip, whatever you need to do to get there. But we are excited about beginning a new new series today. We have been in a series. We took a week off. And as I prayed through, do we continue to preach outside of series? Or do we start in on what we had already planned? The Lord just really impressed upon my heart that as Christians, no matter what we're dealing with, no matter what's in our lives, no matter what we face... We know this to be true, that we have things to rejoice over. We have things to celebrate. And Easter is on the horizon, so we celebrate the cross of Christ where he paid the price for our sin, and we celebrate the empty tomb where he proved he was everything he said he was, that everything he said was true, and that we have life forever because of him. And so we're going to celebrate that. We're going to begin that series even right now in Matthew chapter 21. In this passage, we're going to see Jesus begin to work his way towards Jerusalem. He's actually going to come to a suburb of Jerusalem, and he's going to send his disciples in to do something very interesting, something a little bit different. And during that time, while he's sending these people in, we're going to see something unfold that's very important for us, and we're going to latch around this one truth, one major truth that we're going to focus on today, and that is this, Jesus is King. Now, normally, if we were in the room together, I'd say, say it with me, Jesus is king. I'm going to ask you to do it even as awkward as it feels right where you're standing. If you're in your car, if you're on your couch, whatever, say it with me, Jesus is king. We believe that to be true as Christians, and that's the truth that we're going to wrap around today as we begin this series on the Passion Week of Christ. We're going to focus on the triumphal entry, the moment where Jesus came into the city in Matthew chapter 21. Now again, this idea that Jesus is the king, it's a, it's a great idea. It's a great premise. It's a thought that we love. It, it's something that we can celebrate very easy in the easy times. But our hope today is to wrap our minds around the fact that Jesus is the king, yes, even when he enters triumphantly, but he is also the king when he was on the cross, and he is still the king after rising from the dead. That is the scope of this series. And so today, as we think about Jesus, even in the midst of the darkest times, a pastor friend of mine said that during this time where things seem so out of place, he is reminded of how the disciples must have felt in those days between Jesus' death and Jesus' resurrection. Even in the darkest of days, we hold tight to this truth that Jesus is our king. Hopefully by now you've had time to get to Matthew chapter 21. Uh, In context, Jesus has just fed the 5,000. He's done some other miracles, and now they're walking their way to Jerusalem. So let's look, beginning in verse 1 of Matthew 21. Let's see this. When they approached Jerusalem and they came to Bethphage, Bethphage is kind of a, a, it's a suburb of 
Jerusalem. Think Taylor's to Greenville. Think, uh, think along those lines. Think Marietta to uh, Atlanta, if you're trying to think of a bigger town. This is kind of that idea. So they came there at the Mount of Olives, and Jesus then sent two disciples, telling them, Go into the village ahead of you, and at once you will find a donkey tied there with her colt. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, by the way, if you go and steal somebody's car today, they're probably going to say something to you. So they might have said that in this circumstance. Jesus said, hey, if anybody says anything to you, say that the Lord needs it, and he will send them at once. So Jesus sends his disciples in to borrow a donkey and a baby donkey, and the only answer that they're supposed to give if they are asked, why are you taking these animals, is the Lord needs them. What are we supposed to take from that? It's just this crazy idea, but here's one thing you can take from that truth, that your sacrifice on God's behalf makes statements about who Jesus is, because we're going to see a very important truth about Jesus riding in on this donkey. Verse 4, this took place so that what was spoken through the prophet might be fulfilled. Referring here to Zechariah, the prophet Zechariah, in chapter 9, verse 9, it says, Tell daughter Zion, see your king. Remember, Jesus is king. See your king is coming to you, gentle and mounted on a donkey and on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So Jesus, he comes to the edge of the city and This is the week of Passover. There's lots of people there. And he stops and he sends his disciples for a donkey. This just doesn't seem to make sense. If Jesus was going to come into the city in the triumphal entry, why wouldn't he come in on a giant, strong stallion? Why wouldn't he come in being pulled like a chair in a chariot so that people could just see him as the exalted king? Well, there's a very specific purpose other than just to fulfill this truth, other than just to fulfill this text and this prophecy fulfilled. You know, it's funny, I I, I noticed uh, a friend of mine who's a pastor posted a church sign, and the church sign said, uh, due to unforeseen circumstances, our prophecy class has been canceled. I found that hysterical because it's this idea that prophecy and unforeseen circumstances don't seem to mix. And yet Jesus knew the prophecy and so he wanted the donkey to come in. But there's a specific reason why he would enter on a donkey. It's because the donkey is the servant animal. The donkey is the work animal. The donkey is a humble animal that just does what it's told and does the hard work. It's a servant's animal. And this is the thing I want us to understand. By Jesus riding in on a donkey, he is making a statement. He is saying, I am the servant king. And this is the truth for us. Jesus is the servant king. When we look at Jesus' life, he could have done miracles upon miracles to prove himself and to show everything that he could reign over. We remember when he was tempted by the devil that he was told that he could rule over all these things, and yet he had a different purpose. He had a different reason for being here. Jesus is the king, but he's the servant king. Now, this is unusual because kings have servants, But kings aren't servants, and yet here we see Jesus setting himself apart. Rather than coming in on a stallion, rather than coming in in a chariot, he comes in on a donkey showing himself as the humble servant king he is. He even taught his disciples this truth in Matthew chapter 20, verses 26 through 28. Just a chapter before this, we read this. It says, it must not be like this among you. What happened was the disciples were fighting amongst themselves. They were kind of arguing within themselves that they were fighting and and who wanted to be the biggest and the most important. Jesus said, you don't need to do this. He said, it must not be like this among you, verse 26. On the contrary, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be your slave. And then he says this, Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, Jesus could have come to be served because he is the great high king, and yet he came as a servant, as a humble servant for us. I want you to notice Jesus' humility. Jesus at any point could have handled things in any number of ways, and yet this humble nature exuded from Jesus. And we should be humble as well. 
You know, many people today are feeling prideful about where they are and what they're doing, and yet the reality is we never see pride seep into Jesus' life. And so we should be humble like Jesus. As a matter of fact, Paul wrote to the Philippians in chapter 2. He said this, beginning in verse 5. Adopt the same attitude as that of Christ Jesus, who existing in the form of God did not consider equality with God as something to be exploited, held on to, grasped. Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a servant. The form of what? The form of a servant. A servant king, I would add, but a servant. Taking on the likeness of man. And when he had come as a human, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Jesus was humble. Verse 9, For this reason God has highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow. Why will every knee bow? Because he is also king. He is servant and he is king. In heaven and on earth and under the earth, verse 11, and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Jesus was humble. And Jesus was king. We should be humble servants like our king. So I ask you, who are you serving today? Who are you serving in your life? Are you investing your life into serving people that are around you? Right now, there are elderly people that may be in your neighborhood, that are in your sphere of influence, that are in your life, that need help. They need someone to come alongside to cut their grass because believe it or not, the grass is growing and it's growing thick to come alongside and maybe go pick up prescriptions for them, to come alongside and maybe go pick up dinner. You know what? They're probably just as frustrated as you are about being stuck in your house, except for they can't get out because it's more dangerous for them. How can you come alongside to serve people? How could you come alongside and serve someone you know that's in the medical industry, that's working in the medical field to try to help people in times where they are very, very concerned about the sickness that they might walk into contact with? How can we come alongside and serve our local leaders and our law enforcement and our first responders? Who and how are you serving? Now, here's, here's my request of you. If you are serving someone, if you are serving in some way, we want to know about it as a church. And so what we want to do is we want to celebrate that with you. And there's two ways we can do that. Number one, you can text us so that we can celebrate alongside of you at our text number. It's down in the bottom, uh, uh, to me, right, bottom left of your screen, 864-469-4084. We want, to te- we want to know about that. So text us and let us know how you're serving people. You can also go online, and if you will tag whatever you're doing, if you want to put it on social media and tag it, RBC United. RBC United. Hashtag RBC United. You'll see more about that on our social media soon, but hashtag RBC United. If you go online and you tag that, we'll know about it and we'll be able to celebrate along with you this humility. So how are we being humble like our servant king? But I just want to ask you very plainly, are you serving anyone right now? I mean, are you really serving anyone right now or are you just wanting to be served? Jesus came not to be served, but to serve. He is our model. He is our servant king. Are you looking to be served or just to serve? This is the truth of our life. This is the truth of this passage that we see, that Jesus is the servant king. Jesus is the servant king. But that's not all we see from this passage. We see more from this passage as we continue on into verse 6. Matthew chapter 21, verse 6, if you're following along, it says this, the disciples went and did just as Jesus directed them. It's a pretty good thing for the disciples to do. They should do what he asked them to do. And so they brought the donkey and the colt, and then they laid their clothes on them, and he sat on them. And a very large crowd spread their clothes on the road. Now, this didn't make sense to me. Like, we're spreading our clothes, our our coats on the road. Why would we be doing this? This doesn't connect. And yet, what I found was this is actually a callback, you might say. This is a reference back to 2 Kings chapter 9. In 2 Kings chapter 9, when King Jehu entered into the town, people threw their cloaks and their garments onto the floor for him to come on. So this is another way they're showing that Jesus is is king. Others, beyond putting their clothes on the road, others were cutting branches from the trees and spreading them 
on the road. These palm branches, because that's the kind of trees we're talking about, these palm branches signify joy and triumph. They would be thrown at the feet of soldiers and warriors coming back from war who had triumphed and who had shown themselves to be worthy, who had won the war. And so we see more about this, more truths that the crowd really sees Jesus as this king. They're, they're, they're throwing their clothes on the ground. They're throwing these branches on the ground. And so they're setting Jesus up as king. But not only are they showing him as king, we're going to see that they're also calling him king. Look at verse 9. Then the crowds who went ahead of him, those who followed, shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Son of David. This is important because David at this point was known as the greatest king of Israel. And so Hosanna to the son of David. Jesus must be the son of David, which means he is part of this kingly line. He is part of this royal line and he is king. Hosanna to the son of David, it says. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest heaven. Verse 10. And when he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was in an uproar. This wasn't some small thing that happened in a small location. When Jesus entered the city, the Bible says that the whole city was in uproar. And they were saying this, who is this? And the crowds that had been following him were saying, this is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth in Galilee. People clearly were celebrating Jesus as king. So the disciples They bring him the donkey. They throw their clothes on the donkey. Then people are throwing their clothes in the street, palm branches in the street. It's this giant parade that is happening in the streets of Jerusalem. And the crowd begins to go, get on board. They're following along. Yeah, yeah, Hosanna. Hosanna in the highest. Hosanna to the king of kings. Hosanna to the son of David. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And I left myself wondering, what does Hosanna mean? Like, I don't know anybody named Hosanna. It's not a phrase that's used a lot that I know of, certainly not in our culture today. What does this even mean? And so I looked up the word Hosanna. And the word Hosanna, we get Hosanna in English. It's translated from the Greek word that's very similar, which is actually just the Hebrew word said in Greek. And so it's, it's, it's a translation of a translation of a Hebrew word that literally means save me. It's this idea of save me. And so Jesus is coming in and the people are singing, Hosanna, save me, save me, save me. And they thought that Jesus was coming with revolution in the sense of natural revolution, to overthrow Rome, to lead the people out and to push the people out from under the bondage of Rome. But that is not what Jesus had in store. Jesus is the saving king, but that is not what he has in store. But the truth I want us to pull from this is this. Jesus is the saving king. I want to say that again. Because you might be watching today and you've never considered Jesus as king. You've never considered that he is the king of all the universe and he is the king of your life. You might be watching today and you're not even sure you completely believe in this whole Jesus thing, but here's what I want you to understand. Jesus is the saving king. He came to save the people. Jesus is not some tyrant seeking who he can rule over or oppress. See, that's sin. Sin rules over us before Christ. It oppresses us and it puts us in bondage. That's why you feel that you're completely chained down to whatever different thing it is that holds you to whatever this certain behavior or this certain habit that just has complete control over you. But but Jesus offers freedom. Jesus offers hope because Jesus is a saving king. Jesus is the king who saves Romans chapter 8 verse 1 and on Wednesday nights we had just started a series on Romans chapter 8 and we were just getting into it good we were four verses in but I want to remind you of verse 1 it says this therefore there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus see sin oppresses us and condemns us because we have no control over ourselves under sin but Christ offers us freedom from that condemnation because Jesus is the saving king. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. When we look to that passage, Jesus said this, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. He came to search for the lost and to save them. Why? Because Jesus is the saving king. 
The reality of Scripture is that everyone is either under the oppression of sin or under the freedom of Christ. We're either citizens of Christ's kingdom, by the way, the word kingdom under a king, or we are suffering under the oppression of sin and death. But Christ came, Jesus came to be a saving king. As Christians, that gives us a a, a reason. That gives us something we have to do. There's an objective if we understand that Jesus is the saving king. When we understand Jesus is the saving king, then we understand that there are literally millions of people all around us, people who live next door to us, people who work near us, people who are in community with us, who desperately need to be saved because they are under the oppression of sin, which leads to death and separation from God forever. But Christ, the saving king, has brought life. So we as Christians, we have a responsibility. We say it this way. We must be messengers of God's grace and go and make messengers of God's grace. We must take the gospel to the world. That is our responsibility. That is our purpose. That is something we must do. If Jesus is our king, we must obey his command. In Romans chapter 10, we see these verses. It says, For everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Why? Because Jesus is the saving king. But then Paul asked this question to the Romans. But how then can they call on him that they've not believed in? And how can they believe without hearing about him? And how can they hear about him without a preacher? That doesn't mean like a preacher or like a pastor. It means someone who preaches. And how can they preach unless they are sent? Christian, we have been sent to take the gospel to the world. And then he says this, as it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. The gospel is good news. The fact that Jesus is the saving king is good news. But as Greg Laurie taught us in a series we looked at not long ago, it's only good news if it gets there in time. Good news is only good news if it gets there in time. And so we must take the gospel and we must continue to take the gospel. Even in these uncertain times, even in these uncertain ways, we must focus on taking the gospel because Jesus, yes, is the servant king, but I want you to remember, Jesus is our saving king. Jesus is our saving king. Well, Chris, that's great. We got this great truth from the first 11 verses in this scripture. What, what do I do with that, Chris? What do I do to utilize and to work out the truth that I live under a servant king and a saving king? What do I do to, to live this out in life and even in our current circumstance? Well, here's two thoughts that I want you to take with you today. First, if you proclaim Jesus as king, you must submit to his plan. If you claim that Jesus is king, you must submit to his plan. Now, I know right now this plan looks really strange. I know right now the plan seems unusual, but I also know that God is in control. Jesus, the saving servant king, Jesus, the king, is in control, and he has things under control control and so we must trust his plan even when we don't understand even when it doesn't make sense even when things hurt even when we're struggling we must trust his plan we trust his plan we believe in this verse that I've been saying over and over and over to myself over the last few weeks just reminding myself that in spite of COVID-19 in spite of the economy in spite of sickness in spite of hurt in spite of being alone this truth still reigns supreme in God's word Word, it tells us this Romans chapter 8 28 verse 28 we know that all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose not some things not partial things all things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose he's working all this for good maybe in a way that we don't understand can I remind you this Jesus in this moment of the triumphal entry, he's excited. People are singing, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna to the son of David. And yet the very people who shouted Hosanna five days later would shout, crucify him. Crucify him. We have no king but Caesar. Crucify him. That seems like the plan has shifted dramatically, but the plan never changed. Because God was working all of this together all alone. If we call Jesus king, 
We must trust his plans, and we must trust that he is working it all out. Secondly, there's another truth I want us to focus on, and that's this. If you proclaim Jesus as king, you must obey his commands. Now, this is tough for us. We don't like the idea of obeying. We want to be able to do what we want to do. I want to be in charge of my life. I live in America, the land of the free, the home of the brave. I can do whatever I want, except we as Christians are under a king. And if Jesus is our king, we must obey his commands. So what were his commands? Love God with all that you are and love others as yourself. How are you doing that right now, believer? How are you loving God with all that you are? How are you loving your neighbor neighbor as yourself? What are you doing to show people the love of Christ? In this moment, in this time, in this place, in this circumstance, in the world that we live in today, your acts of love and kindness are more effective in sharing the gospel than ever before. Because people, they don't know what to believe. They're trapped in a hopeless feeling some even trapped in their homes. But Christ, the saving servant king, offers hope. So we must obey his command. And of course, we talked about the biggest command that he gave us. We call it the great commission to go and make disciples of all nations. That is, we say it this way, go and make messengers of God's grace. What are you doing even in this moment? Can I help you? Can I give you some ideas? Check on the elderly people who live around you. Check on the elderly people who live around you. Go have a conversation. Look to the, to the single mom in your life that you're connected to. Maybe they live in your neighborhood. Maybe their kids play sports with you. Maybe they work at a restaurant that you normally attend. And maybe right now, because they're a server, they are really hurting. Can you give financially? Can you sacrifice some food or some money to show love and grace to that person? Because here's what I promise you. If you love her as your neighbor you will have the opportunity to show the love of the gospel and the love of Christ to her. What are you going to do to obey the commands that Jesus has given us? Jesus is our king. He is our servant king. He is our savior king. And so the question becomes, Chris, what do I do now? How do I respond to this message, Chris? How do I respond to this message? Well, there's three ways. First, maybe you need to make Jesus the king of your life. Maybe you're watching the service right now and you realize that you've been dependent on all the wrong things. You've never considered Jesus as the king of your life. You've thought about him. You've even thought about church. You've attended church and you've thought, well, because I go to church, I'm a good person. You've done some good things and you think, well, if I do more good than I do bad, then that'll be good enough. You, you've, you've thought about the fact that your family was Christians and everybody you knew... Or maybe you just haven't believed any of this, but today, through the reading of his word, through understanding all that God is doing, you feel called in this very moment to make Jesus the king of your life. I'll remind you of that verse, Romans 10, 13. Whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And if Jesus is your Lord, then he is your king. So non-believer, today, put your faith in Jesus right now. Right now. You say, Chris, what does that look like? Well, first you have to admit that you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. Every one of us has sinned. And in that sin, we have earned death. We have earned the opportunity to be separated from God forever. We have earned that wage to be separated from God forever. But the Bible teaches us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so if you will understand your sinfulness, You'll ask God to forgive you of your sinfulness. Christ came and died at the price of death that you were owed. The the debt you owed, the death you owed, the wages of your sin that was death, Christ died in your place if you will receive his grace. And so then you can be made alive in Christ and you can make him your Lord. You can repent of your sin. You can ask God to forgive you and you can make him the Lord of your life. You can make Jesus your king. I want you to do that right now. If you're a non-believer and you're watching right now, right now, would you just pray? I'm going to pray along with you. Would you just pray, God, I know I've sinned. And that sin means that I deserve death. God, forgive me of my sin and let Jesus' payment take my place. 
God, I don't want to live that way anymore. I want to follow Jesus as my King. And I proclaim Him as the risen, serving, saving King. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. If you prayed to receive Christ today, do me a favor right now. Do me a favor. Text us and let us know. That number is 864-469-4084. Text us and let us know the decision you made to follow Jesus today. We want to follow up with you and help you take your next steps. But maybe you're a Christian and you necessarily, you haven't lived as though Jesus is king of your life. Maybe today what you need to do is you need to stop right now and pray and ask God to forgive you where you have tried to be the king of your own life. And commit yourself to serving God and to serving people around you, to showing the love that Christ has given you so that you can be the type of kingdom citizen that our king, our saving king, our serving king has called us to be. Lastly, maybe today you need to find someone to show love to. Today you need to go be humble and you need to go show the love of Christ to someone. We'd love to know whatever decision you made today. So if you'd text that number, 864-469-404, tell us of the, of the decisions you made. Maybe you want to go online to our, uh, our social media accounts, RBC Greer, and you want to let us know what you've decided based on today's sermon. I want to celebrate alongside of you the decision you've made, and we want to walk with you through this moment. Right now, You've had an opportunity to pray and repent, to pray and become a believer. I want you to sing to the King. We're going to sing about Jesus, the King of our heart. I know it's awkward sing in your living room. You may not even like hearing your own voice. Sing to your King as we sing to our King, Jesus, the serving King, the saving King, the risen King. Will you sing with us? Let the king of my heart be the mountain where I run, the fountain I drink from, always my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide, the ransom for my life, always my song. You are
God, you are good. So good. And we thank you for how good and wonderful you are. I'm reminded of your word. It says, you are good and your mercy endures forever. Lord, the things we're facing in our lives right now, we need your mercy more than ever. Oh, but God, you are so good. You are so, so good. May we be the bringers of good news. May we go and make messengers of your grace. May we share the gospel and share the love that you have given to us because you are so, so good, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. I want to encourage you. We are meant to make messengers of God's grace. One of the things we say here at Riverside is that grace meets needs. So how can you go out and be a messenger? How can you go out and take the message of God's grace? By going and meeting needs. By reaching out to people in your life that are hurting. Many whose jobs are lost now. Many who are struggling to make ends meet because they were servers or different, uh, work in different professions where now they're not able to work like they were. How can you help meet someone else's needs to bring God glory and to take them the gospel? Think about that today. Come up with some ways. Hashtag RBC United. Let us know what you do and go and make messengers of God's grace. Have a great afternoon.